had such a firm belief in the responsibility of designers to society, to the entire community around us. Milton was not just designer and illustrator. He was doing all these different things as a true Renaissance man. Students at Cooper Union referred to him as Uncle Milton, even though most of us had never met him. People in the community up here in Woodstock have always loved and celebrated. Milton was like the mayor up here. Every single work that he has made has touched somebody in some way that I cannot imagine. My favorite Milton Glaser pieces summarize, encapsulate icons and legends for history. Milton mulled it over for a minute or two, then launched into an elaborate metaphor in which he related the restructuring of a magazine to the deboning of a chicken. I was put on the extension of the phone and I could hear Milton saying, who is this little creep? Milton said, don't say a word, take it home, put it on your kitchen table, show it to your wife, live with it for a week. I think that's why they call Milton a genius. To know and to work with Milton was a great gift for me. It was pure luck that we came from the same school at the same time. Being with him and having conversation with him, his personality, so strong, so generous, time spent with him was just wonderful. Hello, I'm Mike Essel, Dean of the Cooper Union School of Art. Welcome to Cooper Union, and thank you for joining us tonight to celebrate Milton Glaser's life and work. And thank you to Brooklyn Brewery, Milton's longtime collaborator, for sponsoring tonight's event and the exhibition currently on display at Cooper Union. Milton Glaser graduated from Cooper Union in 1951 and in 1954 founded Pushpin Studios with his classmates Seymour Quast, Reynold Ruffins, and Edward Sorrell. Pushpin went on to become an international force with a legacy that continues to inspire today. Glazer is best known for his iconic work for Bob Dylan, his I Love New York logo, and for co-founding New York Magazine. But I hope we will also remember and celebrate his mentorship, his writing, and his activism. Milton Glazer was a Fulbright Scholar, an AIGA medalist, our most distinguished honor in graphic design, and was the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. And in 2009, he became the first graphic designer to receive the National Medal of Arts, the highest government honor awarded to artists. Glazer returned to Cooper Union in 1986 and served as a trustee until 2002. And Cooper Union honored Milton Glazer with our Augustus St. Gaudens Award, the President's Citation, the Urban Visionaries Award, and he was inducted into the Cooper Union Hall of Fame in 2009. We are incredibly grateful for Milton Glaser's lifetime support of Cooper Union. On a personal note, I would not be here today as Dean of the School of Art were it not for Milton Glaser. I discovered Milton's work when I was 13. His book, Milton Glaser Graphic Design, was the only book on design in my junior high school's library. I vividly remember sitting on the floor, reading his book, and finally understanding what I wanted to do with my life. I applied to Cooper Union not because I knew it was a great school, but because Milton Glaser was a graduate. Years later, I invited Milton to speak at a free conference for students, and I was fortunate to spend time with him backstage. I finally got to share with him what his work meant to me and how it had led me to design. We connected over our shared love of Cooper Union, and I will never forget what he said to me. The scholarship to Cooper Union was the most important gift I ever received. You can help continue this gift for future students by making a donation to the School of Art in memory of Milton Glaser. For tonight's program, we've asked designers and artists to share their personal stories about Milton Glaser and his work. Thank you to all of our guests tonight for sharing with us. Thank you again to Brooklyn Brewery for their support. And thank you, Milton Glaser, for everything. Hi, uh, my name is Gail Anderson, and I am chair of BFA Design 
in BFA Advertising at the School of Visual Arts and Creative Director at Visual Arts Press at SVA. So many Milton posters to choose from. Do I choose Love and Spoonfuls or Simon and Garfunkel, both of which are framed in my bedroom? And then there are the cats. There's Creatures Large and Small, which is one of my favorites, Annie, Milton's beloved kitty. There's the 1985 Catskill Cat for the New York Board of Tourism, really popular poster. There's another Catskill Cat that's a little bit of a, a, bit of a creepy kitty. Um, it's the Catskill Fall Festival poster. And there's also the wonderful world of Catskill cuisine for Windows on the World that's got Milton writing on it. So which one? Uh, I have to choose the 1985 Catskill Cat poster because it's got Milton's I Love New York logo on top. It's got total Milton type Catskills with the big drop shadow. Uh, and it's just this sweet, happy poster that uh, people in the community up here in Woodstock have always loved and celebrated. When I first came up here, I was like, there's that poster, there's that poster, there's that poster in so many stores. And Milton was like the mayor up here. The whole community loved it. So it worked. And he'd say that was one of his most popular posters that people always bought that damn poster, that damn cat. And I, I just, I just love that. I, I love that Milton was a cat guy. I don't know. That's all I got to say. This, all these cat posters, Annie, I've got upstairs framed. I've got cat, cat still cats here waiting to frame. Uh, I miss you, Milton. Exactly 50 years ago, I had my first encounter with Milton Glaser. It was 1971 and I was a sophomore in high school in Lutherville, Maryland, and we were assigned to read this book, this Signet classic. And other than the label, there were just three names on the cover. Shakespeare, Julius Caesar, and Milton Glaser. I was intrigued that somebody could tell such a powerful story with such simple line and a little splash of color. Four years later, as a sophomore at the Cooper Union, I actually met the guy. I took a class with him and it was wonderful. Milton Glaser was teaching with Henry Wolfe a class in editorial design. And what was great about it was that they argued through the entire thing. Milton was a towering man and he stood over Henry Wolfe, but he showed the utmost respect for Henry Wolfe's ideas as he smashed them to the ground. The whole class would gather at break at the water fountain and down a Tylenol so that we could endure the second half of the class, but we loved it because it was freeing to see that there weren't rules in graphic design. There, were, there was passion, there was opinion, there were ideas, and there was freedom. It was the greatest way to enter into New York. For sure, Milton's passing is sad, but he hasn't really left us. His incredible, energetic, dedicated lifetime of work, his decades of teaching students, his mentorship of designers and artists from all over the world who would flock to 32nd Street. These things and his moral leadership are still with, with us, and these gifts are still flourishing. We're so lucky to have had him among us. Hello, my name is Walter Bernard. I've known Milton Glaser for over 50 years, first as a student, then as art director of New York Magazine, and finally as a partner with him in WBMG Design. Together we designed over 100 newspapers and magazines around the world. But today I want to talk to you about his work at New York Magazine. New York Magazine was founded by Clay and Milton in 1968. It was unique as a city publication, put out every week by a small staff at 207 East 32nd Street, a four-floor walk-up. 
Milton was on the second floor at Pushpin Studios and we were on the fourth. Milton was the design director and I was the art director. As you can imagine, he was pretty busy at Pushpin, but we still met several times a day. While others moved on to computer desks, Milton worked at a simple drawing board almost until he died. He always felt that his ability to draw was his greatest skill. I've watched him work since 1968 and still marvel at the numerous creations he's made. But what stands out to me is how much he loved to work. So, for this episode, I have chosen a wonderful spot drawings that Milton did for the Underground Gourmet. This was a column he and Jerome wrote together for New York Magazine for nine years. Besides loving to work, Milton loved lunch. So what could possibly be a better task for him than to have these weekly lunches of discovery with Jerome and the magazine colleagues he brought along? It was Jerome's job to surreptitiously steal the menu, and later it will be Milton's job to do an ink drawing to accompany the article. This column exemplified New York Magazine's brand of service journalism, a service both to the patrons and under-the-radar establishments that didn't have the budget to advertise in magazines. The result was that the prohibition against eating strange, cheap food was broken. At some point, it even became fashionable. Looking at these drawings again, one can see that they were done with a lot of care and affection. It seemed he was doing it almost effortlessly, almost like handwriting. Over the nine years, Milton produced over 225 drawings for the column. Even if he spent only a few minutes on one of these little spots, they were always done with knowledge, with wit, and craftsmanship. It was indeed an inspiration to watch him work and to watch him eat. Hi, my name is John Key. I teach graphic design at Cooper Union and I run the graphic design studio Morcos Key. I'm super excited today to talk with you about one of my favorite Milton Glaser pieces, which is a 1968 lithographic poster of Aretha Franklin. The poster was originally made in 1968 for iMagazine. It really captures the essence of Aretha Franklin. From the rich, nostalgic colors, using orange, navy, violet, and kind of this greenish color, really, again, makes you think about the time period of Aretha Franklin, some of the clothes that she's wearing, and again, her overall inspirational sound and voice. Her skin is painted in this beautiful brown gold color. It leads to her mouth and her face belting. And again, everyone knows who Aretha Franklin is and you can imagine her singing in this poster. I love the way also her hair is treated crowned on her head. This orange over the top cloud-like sculpture, I think really does summarize some of the crazy beautiful hairstyles that Aretha was known for as well. I also love the typeface, which seems to me like an abstraction of one of Milton Glaser's most famous typefaces, Baby Teeth, but done in a kind of specialized way for Aretha and features three colors similar to the colors present in the actual illustration itself. It was recently acquired into the National Portrait Museum in Washington, D.C. in 2015, where Aretha Franklin was there, standing next to the poster. And you can see the resemblance and, I don't know, this energy that I think is very present in both of the image and also, obviously, Aretha herself. I am so happy that I was able to share this with you. Hopefully everyone can put on their favorite Aretha Franklin song and look this image up and be reminded of how graphic design can really summarize, encapsulate, memorialize icons and legends for history. I'm Stephen Heller. I uh, am the co-chair of MFA Design, designer as entrepreneur at the School of Visual Arts. For over 30 years, I was at the New York Times as a senior art director, art director of the book review and uh, art director of the op-ed page for a little while. Before that, uh, I actually came straight from Screw magazine, which was an underground pornographic newspaper that uh, 
in its day led the sexual revolution in the United States and specifically the island off the coast of the US, New York City. Despite the fact that they were zooming off the charts and circulation at that time, uh, I thought it needed a refresh. So I suggested, since I had heard the name Pushpin Studios, that they hire Pushpin Studios to redesign Screw. Uh, having no real idea what Pushpin was going to do or how they were going to react, I actually figured they would turn Screw down. I later learned from Seymour Quast, the co-founder with Milton Glaser, that they took anything that paid. So on one fateful day, we made an appointment to go to their brownstone on uh, East 32nd Street and meet with Milton Glaser and uh, Seymour Quast and look at the pages that they had redesigned, looked at the format. My publisher and friend at the time, Al Goldstein, was reticent to do something as uh, decorative as Pushpin was offering. Um, and I was as well. I wasn't sure what I wanted. I mean, I had no real business being in that office. Um, and then they pulled out something that was actually quite tame by underground paper standards. It was very gridded uh, and paradoxically the logo was done in Helvetica. Uh, I didn't really know what the typeface was but I knew that the sanitation trucks in New York used it so it had to be good. And the one mnemonic, the one thing that kind of stood out was that the E erected itself into the W. So um, we thought, huh, we've got a corporate looking cover with an erection and uh, wouldn't that be amusing on the newsstands? Screw at the time was being investigated all the time by the police. There were always confiscations off newsstands. And this would put it into another ballpark. This would make it more legitimate. And we said, let's go with that. When they were finished with the uh, layouts, um, the, the templates for the layouts, they sent them over uh, as pieces of... Uh, as mechanicals with tissue paper and markings over them. And I looked at it and I thought, I can't work with this. There's nothing to do here but follow a format and pick out nasty pictures from our photo files. So I took the pages and I marked them all up and took what was clean and made it dirty again and took what was rational and made it irrational. And uh, basically uh, took what S Goldstein and uh, his partner, Jim Buckley, had paid a considerable amount of money for and threw it in the trash. Uh, I convinced them that I was right. And so they had to call Milton and Seymour and say, we want to make changes. I was put on the extension of the phone and I could hear Milton saying, who is this little creep? Uh, in words of that ilk. And uh, Goldstein was sitting there smiling and saying, oh, we trust him a lot. He's young, but he's got gumption. Anyway, I lost the battle. Uh, and Goldstein invited Milton and Seymour to come see the first issue in its pasted up form, in its ready for press form. And uh, they came into my studio, which was in a loft building on 17th Street, west of Fifth Avenue. Uh, Screw had taken it over from an S&M studio. Uh, I had... Uh, 
a desk in the corner. Uh, there was a desk next to me for my assistant. And the rest of this 16 to 1700 square foot loft was filled more or less with paper garbage. We just put all the garbage in piles on the floor and it was never cleaned up. So it was like mountains of landfill. And Milton and Seymour walked in. They seemed to be oblivious to the conditions of the place. They looked at the layouts. They asked for some changes, which I may or may not have made. Uh, they left. And that was the end of it. We had to send them the first issues off press for the next month so they could make whatever little tweaks or refinements they wanted to. Uh, and Milton was more or less a gentleman about all that I had done. And for at least a year, I kept it the Milton Glazer Seymour Quast layout um, until I just got fed up. I changed the logo. I didn't take out the erect E, um, but I did have an illustrator named Leslie Carbaga, who was a young whippersnapper at the time. And he took the logo, he airbrushed it, curved the the right angles of the Helvetica and made it into a balloon, basically. And that became the logo as a duotone for the next six or seven years. And that was, uh, that was it. I later met Seymour and Milton when I moved on to the New York Times and I had to go back up to their studio uh, to negotiate a cover that they were doing. And I tried to remind them of what had happened a few years earlier. And uh, it became a running joke for the next 35 years. A few years ago, Milton was honored by the Brooklyn Historical Society. In his acceptance speech, he recalled that when he graduated from high school, he was awarded a full scholarship at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. All he had to do was pass a perfunctory entrance exam. Well, he flunked the exam. So the dean of Pratt said, why don't you start in the night school and then we can move you into the full program. Milton proceeded to flunk the entrance exam for night school. Pratt's loss was Cooper Union's gain. Clearly, the Cooper uh, admissions department is much more sophisticated than Pratt's and discriminating than Pratt's. Milton was very passionate in his support for Cooper Union and its mission. I met Milton 35 years ago when I was trying to start the Brooklyn Brewery. His gatekeeper blew me off when I first called the studio. Do you know who Milton is? She said. After a week of harassing her, I finally got to talk to Milton and he loved the idea of starting a brewery in Brooklyn. I wanted to call the company Brooklyn Eagle Beer after the legendary Brooklyn newspaper. I used to be a journalist. At our first design meeting, I told Milton I wanted the Brooklyn Bridge and the Brooklyn Dodgers and Brooklyn's role as a landing spot for immigrants, all of that expressed in the logo. Milton said, look, we have Brooklyn here. No one is focusing on Brooklyn. It's an undervalued place. Let's just call the company Brooklyn Brewery, Brooklyn Lager Beer. A week later, he unveiled the logo with that flowing script B that many people mistakenly think came from the Brooklyn Dodgers. I said, is that it? Milton said, don't say a word, take it home, put it on your kitchen table, show it to your wife, live with it for a week. I did what he said and the simple elegance of that logo sunk in. 
That logo and the focus on Brooklyn has been key to Brooklyn Brewery's success. We are now an international brand. I think that's why they call Milton a genius. Milton and I became close friends and had lunch together weekly. He was the most thoughtful and creative person I have ever known. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sohong Drew and I am so honored to be here um, and pay tribute to the one and only Milton Glaser. When I was doing research of his work in my second year in college, I found this one poster that kind of blew me away, which is the 1988 New York Film Festival poster that Milton has created. What drew my attention is not only it was a horizontal poster that somehow blew my mind, but also the simplicity, the composition, the color. I think Milton is the only person on this planet who has managed to make belly, fat belly, looked great on a poster. That is the power of Milton. Milton can transform an object, a subject, and then make an impact. Whether that impact is political, or the impact is personal, or the impact is humor, or the impact is societal, every single work that he has made has touched somebody in some way. I want to say thank you so much, Milton, for inspiring every single one of us and to change our industry and then change the work that we make for the better. We miss you. My name is Seymour Quast. Milton and I graduated from Cooper Union with diplomas in 1951. There are two projects of Milton's that I, I always admire. One was his poster for Mahalia Jackson's concert in 1967. It had a, two versions. One had her facing left with the text forming a quarter circle. The other had her facing right with both versions together, the text panels formed a rainbow. With four copies of the two versions with the text, it formed a complete circle, a sort of kaleidoscope with one copy of the two versions, one could sh show Mahalia facing face to face or back to back. Other configurations are possible. It depends upon the willingness of the person doing the posting to appreciate the possibilities. Oh yes, Milton designed the headline font. The second project I'd like to describe is Milton's format and design for Shakespeare's plays and sonnets. They have a thick black border which neatly frame the art. They all have white backgrounds, allowing these books to stand out among uh, the more colorful commercial editions on the books and bookshelves. The exquisite black and white pen drawings are only partially colored. It shows a sort of spontaneity and suggests that there is a lot more going on. They have a touch of the old masters in a contemporary setting. Milton loved the artists of the Italian Renaissance, especially Piero de, de la Francesca, and he used them for in, inspiration. In the battle of modern versus postmodern, Milton favored the latter. He loved working with the old types until he designed his own. He, along with the rest of us, was captivated by the graphic manifestations of Victoriana, Art Nouveau, and Art Deco. His style and technique went from cartoon to uh, realism, to watercolor, charcoal, and pen and ink. Milton believed in process. For his last book, Sketch and Finish, he talked of how important it is to go through all the steps, keeping your ideas tentative until you know where you're going. Who was Milton Glaser? We both came from the Bronx with immigrant families. We both went to Cooper Union with the same teachers. 
but he had a spark of genius emanating from his brain, his hands, and his heart. He knew where he, he was going, which benefited all of us mere mortals. Thank you. Hi. I'm appearing here in front of you because uh, Cooper Union School asked me to talk about a piece of art of Milton Glaser which influenced me most. Unfortunately, that's almost impossible task because I got influenced by many pieces of art of Milton Glaser. Instead of that, I decide to talk about one book which influenced me probably more, more than most of other books. In early 70s, I started my art high school in my hometown Zagreb, at that time part of communist Yugoslavia. The uh, city had approximately 800,000 citizens, but despite that, had one single bookshop in which one was able to buy foreign art books. Uh, usually they had one single copy of the book, and on top of that, book was very expensive. For example, in 1981, I published my poster, which my first design of poster, I published in this English annual, Modern Publicity. This book at that time was costing me more than money which I got for that designing that poster. Because of that, whenever I came across the foreign book about design, or illustration, I will, if I, and I was not able to afford to buy it, I will flip through the book again and again until I memorize almost every single image. That was quite annoying for uh, uh, book sales people, but kind of, I didn't care. One day in 1974, I discovered that a friend of mine, student and designer, at that time living in uh, Belgrade, Serbia, city which is approximately 250 miles from my hometown Zagreb, bought himself a Milton Glaser book design graphic. From then on, whenever I visited Belgrade, I actually stay in his uh, dorm room because that was a chance for me to flip through that book again and again. I was fascinated by that book. Uh, I saw many books dedicated to about, uh, dedicated to fine artists, about one single art artist. But I never saw up to that point a book dedicated to one single designer of il or illustrator. And on top of that, Milton was not just designer and illustrator. He was also product designer, interior designer, editor, type designer, all these different, he was doing all these different things as a true Renaissance man. And at that time, uh, we students in East Europe, we was thinking that is how artists were supposed to be. Later, I discovered that division among those professions, especially in U.S., it's much wider than appear in books of Milton Glaser, and that he is probably one of the few who managed to breach all these divisions and do all these different. Uh, professions, let's say, in the same time. A few, later, a few years later, I was able to buy or afford to buy that book. That book was partly the reason why in mid-80s I decided to come in New York. In first day of visiting New York, in first 10 days of visiting New York, I visited New York Times, Time Magazine, and Milton Glaser. We became friends. After that, we collaborated uh, on many projects together. We even taught class in Cooper Union together. Then we became neighbors. I moved on top floor of his building, and I was there for 20 plus years. Uh, Milton is not here anymore. But I still have his book. In the meantime, Milton signed this book for me. I managed to collect quite a few pieces of art which appear in this book, somehow fulfilling my 
complex of not having money to buy book, but now I can afford to get art from the book too. And I don't know what else to say, except thank you, Milton. I'm Ellen Lumpton. When I was a student at Cooper Union in the early 80s, Milton Glaser was a legendary figure at our school. In fact, he was the only graphic designer I had actually heard of back in high school. You see, in the 70s and 80s, graphic design just wasn't something people talked about. But Milton Glaser was someone who even I knew about. I had that big tall book of his posters. You were supposed to cut up the book and put the posters on the wall in your bedroom. I am really glad I never cut up that book because it is a treasure to me now. <laughs> Students at Cooper Union referred to him as Uncle Milton, even though most of us had never met him. At the time, however, our teachers at Cooper preferred a more modernist approach based on Swiss design theory. So there is a tension in the air between these two schools of thought, Milton and modernism. This tension was fascinating to a young designer just starting out. My favorite pieces by Milton Glaser are the Olivetti posters, hands down. Milton studied painting in Bologna, Italy with Giorgio Morandi. He soaked up all that Italian Renaissance heritage, as well as Mirandi's very special take on painting. Those influences really shine in the Olivetti posters. These posters offer a magical mix of American comics, classical painting, and 20th century surrealism. Look at this one. The perspective lines shooting into the distance are straight out of a 15th century landscape. The typewriter is sitting on some cosmic kitchen table like a jug or a jar in one of Mirandi's mysterious still lives. In the foreground, a little flight of marble steps blocks our view of the typewriter. Why did Milton do that? Why did Olivetti let him do that? And what is the red sphere? It's a little rubber ball but it's also a huge red moon. This poster is a fantastic work of art and it's an ad for a typewriter. This one is the best of all. What on earth has happened here? Apparently, some Roman god has died of heartbreak after writing a love letter on the Valentine typewriter. That typewriter was designed in 1968 by Ettore Satsas, the legendary Memphis designer. It's a portable typewriter with its own handy carrying case, made of bright red plastic, of course. So, if you are a run-of-the-mill god or goddess, you can carry around your typewriter in the woods and on the beach. You can write passionate love letters while spying on nymphs or turning maidens into trees. And if you're really lucky, your gorgeous dog will find your corpse and mourn for you. I am thankful to Milton Glaser for leaving behind these spectacular works and making us think about art and design and how they belong together. Thank you, Uncle Milton. When you've been working and you've done a job, a comprehensive and sent it to the client. If, if the client rejected it or didn't want it as it was and it was sent back, you open the envelope and if, if, if it was a note that said to, it was unsatisfactory, he'd grab it, you see, he'd say, rejection. Rejection, rejection, do it over again. Rejection, do it over again. And it went the, went the job. It was working to be so intelligent, so sensitive, uh, and big enough, not 
not to be caught up in things that weren't all that important. Is it okay for me to show some grainy pictures? This fellow, that's Milton. Seymour Quash, this is me. And I, I guess I, I find that musical because everybody is so young, strong, and smiling. That's Milton and me. I'm giving him advice that will make his career for him. Ha, ha, ha. That, that, that was our wedding reception. Not our, Milton and me, our, my wife, Joan. One of, one of our, very, excuse me, very early jobs together, as kids almost, we were still, maybe still in school. A, uh, a guy came to, we used to, we, 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 we had a small studio, which was part of a, of a dance uh, studio. And we, we had a, a third of that thing. We kind of worked in the corner. And the fellow had gotten on our names. And, and he came, and as he discussed what it was, to, what it was that he wanted, Milton was, was sketching. And by the time he finished, he ripped the page off, and the guy said, that's it. That's, that's what I want. And that, and that was, that was fast, uh, which, uh, as in my experience at, at Pushpin, all of it seemed to be very fast on, on his, his part. Thoughtful, generous, and so soundly intelligent. But it was a life experience that, that, that I had to so fortunate in having been part of. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexander Tachalovsky. I'm an associate professor at the Cooper Union School of Art. I'm also a curator at the Herb LeBalance Study Center of Design and Typography, also at the Cooper Union. I wanted to close out the evening and in keeping with the format of tonight's event, uh, share a personal story about, um, about a piece of Milton's work that resonated with me when I graduated than when I started working here as a curator. It's a piece that he did with his Cooper classmates, Reynold Ruffins at Sorel uh, and Seymour Quast before they became Pushpin Studios. It's a piece they did in order to focus on the kind of work that they wanted to make, the kind of work that their day jobs weren't necessarily permitting them to do. They had rented a studio here in the East Village and would come after work to focus on the kinds of illustrations, the kind of design that they wanted to make. And in order to get their work out there, they conceived of this ingenious piece called the Pushpin Almanac that in, you know, ultimately inspired the name of the studio to create a vehicle to get their work in front of people who would give them work, art directors, um, creative directors in, in the city. And they did this on, on, um, with very incredibly limited resources. To get this published, uh, they created deals with companies like Quad, uh, an offset company. So in exchange for their services, they would put an ad and design the ad for that client. So it's this really incredible concept of how you can get your work out there in front of others. What it tells me is highlights for me Milton's passion for design and his love of, of the process of graphic design. And the strength of, of that always comes through the work. And I think the stories that you've heard today hopefully give you a better idea of not just Milton's work, but also of Milton as an individual, the kind of work that he made and the kind of choices that he made, which I, I really strongly believe in looking at design history and looking at these objects, but reminding yourself that there's a person behind that work. And the more we understand that person, the more we can be inspired. 
not just by the graphics, but also by who they were. With that, I'm going to close the evening and thank everyone who participated, everyone who shared stories about Milton, um, everyone who put this event together, and of course you in attendance. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this evening. We hope you learned some interesting insight into Milton's work. Remember his work, and hopefully when it's safe soon, you can come and visit and look at his work in person. Uh, Kerberian is fortunate to have a collection of Milton's work, um, and I would encourage you to visit the Milton Glazer Study Center at the SVA, which has uh, an amazing collection of Milton's work. So if you wanted to interact with his work, see it firsthand, uh, do, do take time when, when time permits to come and see his work. But remember to think about the individual um, and, the, and the choices that he made. Milton left an incredible legacy of work, but the testament to that work is who he was and the choices that he made. I think it's, it's really inspirational um, in many, many ways. So with that, I'll end the evening. I thank you for your time uh, and hope to see everyone soon. Be well, be safe. Good night. Mm -hmm.